Now, I told you that the level of stress matters. It matters whether we're talking about mild or we're talking about extreme. So let me give you an example of how that works. Macrophages express both alpha and beta adrenergic receptors. And the alpha and beta adrenergic receptors are going to bind to epinephrine. Now, the alpha receptors are high affinity receptors, which means even if you have low concentrations of epinephrine, it can bind because they're high affinity, whereas the beta receptors are low affinity receptors. So if you're in a low stress situation where you have low levels of epinephrine, it'll bind the alpha receptor. And the alpha receptor binding on a macrophage is going to increase phagocytosis, increase TNF-alpha, increase IL-6. It's going to increase your response to an infection. That's at low stress. At high stress, now you're going to bind to the beta adrenergic receptor. And that decreases phagocytosis and decreases antigen processing and presentation and decreases IL-12, so decreases your Th1 response. So totally different responses um, with low, low stress and high stress. So let's look at our adrenaline responses because they're a little bit different than our cortisol responses for stress. For the endocrine system, <clears throat> adrenaline is going to decrease prolactin and decrease testosterone. And this has been studied in the military, by the way. For the immune system, we're decreasing T regulatory cells. We're increasing Th1. That's kind of the different uh, response there between our cortisol and our epinephrine. And with nervous system, we're degrading memory. So remember, cortisol solidifies the memory, and then now the epinephrine, the adrenaline, decreases um, the memory. And it recovers faster um, with adrenaline. So here we are. Here's an overview of the whole response. So you have your stressor, and you're going to lead to the production of both the sympathetic adrenal medullary axis as well as the HPA axis. HPA axis results in our corticosteroids. The SAM axis results in the adrenaline, noradrenaline. We either suppress the immune response and we convert fat and protein into glucose, or we increase heart rate, blood pressure, et cetera, and decrease digestion and saliva production. So I am advocating for vacations and siestas and decreasing stress, which leads us to this question of does the relaxation response just change all of this? Is it just the opposite? Here's what we know. As adrenaline declines, people feel stable and comfortable, but they maintain their feelings of motivation. And the immune system does recover because the alpha adrenergic receptors are now engaged instead of beta. So yes, the relaxation response, as studied by Herbert Benson, um, just completely uh, switches all of this off. And what does laughter do? Well, laughter is going to increase your natural killer T cells, increase your antibodies, and decrease your pro-inflammatory cytokines. So in general, it's just darn good for you. So we should all do more of that. Um, OK, what about neurotransmitters in the microbiome? Let's bring these guys in here now. So we've got our neurotransmitters, and we know um, the basic functions of our neurotransmitters. So first of all, dopamine. Dopamine is our reward response. You know when you're waiting for that text, and all of a sudden it comes in, and you hear the little bell, and you go, woo -hoo! Dopamine, right? Reward response. Serotonin is our overall joy and happiness response. And then GABA is the relaxation. That's the, the chill response. We think of all of these in response to mood, and we think of them in response to learning. But what we have to remember is they all also have gut effects. And the gut effects are actually profound. And you make more neurotransmitters in your gut than you do in your brain. So what is dopamine doing in the colon? Dopamine is responsible for contraction of your colon. If you don't have dopamine, you have constipation, right? And we know that from Parkinson's disease. People with Parkinson's have constipation, and usually the constipation is showing up seven years before the Parkinson's ever shows up. So important to remember that.
We also know that dopamine has an immune effect. Dopamine drives a TH17 response or a T regulatory response, depending on the level of dopamine. So if you have super physi physiological levels of dopamine, you can drive a TH17 response. Normal levels of dopamine is T reg. For serotonin, serotonin is our happiness, and if you don't have serotonin, anxiety. But serotonin, if dopamine is responsible for contraction, this way, I think of serotonin as pushing this way, right? So you gotta have both from a physics perspective. You gotta squeeze the colon, you gotta push stuff through. So serotonin, also um, huge in the gut, but also has an effect on the immune system. Because they're co-localized, right? 80% of your immune system is in your gut. So it makes sense that your nervous system and your, and your immune system interact. Turns out that serotonin competes with interferon gamma for tryptophan. So if you are having a strong immune response and you're using tryptophan to produce antibodies and interferon gamma, you're not gonna make as much serotonin and you're not gonna be happy about it, okay? So unusual for people to feel happy during a strong immune response, not only because they're making IL-1, IL-6, and TNF-alpha, but also because their serotonin levels are gonna drop. And then GABA. GABA is our relaxation um, hormone. It's the uh, inhibitory neurotransmitter. So what GABA is doing for the gut is it's making it so it's not painful to poop. That's the easiest way to say it. What it's doing for your immune system is decreasing inflammatory cytokines. So GABA is increasing GABA, and when does when is GABA at its typical highest? Melatonin puts you to sleep and GABA keeps you asleep, right? So GABA tends to be at its highest in the middle of the night. And that tends to be when you're resetting with your inflammatory cytokines is in the middle of the night when GABA is at its highest. So how, does, how do all of the neurotransmitters have their effect on the immune system? Well, all the cells of the immune system have neurotransmitter receptors. So in addition to being affected by hormones, because the cytokines have the hormone response elements, they're affected by neurotransmitters because they have receptors for all the neurotransmitters. So we have complete interaction here between the immune system and the nervous system. Now, our nervous system is not just our neurotransmitters, right? It's also endorphins. And endorphins have an effect on immunity as well. So we know that exogenous endorphins, like opioids, um, impair immunity. And in fact, if somebody is on opioids for treatment of pain, for example, it slows the clearance of pretty much any infection, but especially flu. And I say that because flu is highly relevant right now. It's an it's a interesting flu season um, this year with our H3N2 flu that's circulating. But we know that morphine is really um, inhibitory for immunity in the lungs. And opioids also decrease NK activity. NK activity is super important for fighting flu, and it increases the risk for secondary infection of pneumonia. So um, people who are on opioids are necessarily going to have a um, stronger flu response. Speaking of which, I'm gonna go off on a flu tangent for a moment, just because I can. So flu um, got, had a really interesting year last year. And that the University of Arizona did a study that showed that people imprint on the first flu vaccine that they get. Did you see that? So if you were born prior to 1969, you were, your first flu vaccine was probably an H1N1 strain. And this was back in the day when we didn't give three different strains in a flu vaccine. So people imprinted on, on an H1N1 strain. If you were born after 1969, you imprinted on an H3, H, H3N2 strain because we started in, including H3N2 strains into the flu vaccine. And what University of Arizona showed last year is that when you give subsequent follow-up uh, flu shots, what's happening is you're expanding that original population of, of cells you're actually not having a specific response to a specific year, as we previously thought. 
So this idea that we get a flu shot every year to match up with whatever strain is circulating that, that year, it's kind of a fallacy because you're, in, you're expanding whatever original population of cells you had to flu when you get a flu shot. Now that can be good, right? If it's an H1N1 year and you happen to imprint on an H1N1 back, um, virus, then by getting a flu shot, you expand those cells and you're gonna have more immunity to that virus. And likewise, if you imprinted on, on an H3N2 and, and it's H3N2 um, circulating, great, get a flu shot and it's gonna increase those cells. But if they don't match, you get almost no benefit from a flu vaccine. And that's what the University of Arizona showed in that, in that manuscript last year, and there's been subsequent follow-up to that. So it's really interesting because people all, all along are going, oh, should I get a flu vaccine? Should I not get a flu vaccine? Well, it really has to do with how healthy those cells are that you originally started with and which strains are circulating. This year, it's an H3N2 strain that's circulating, so the H3N2, uh, people who imprinted on H3N2 are tending to be healthier than people who didn't. But what's also interesting is that we have a certain effectiveness of our flu vaccines that are going around. And Australia just finished their flu, vac their, their flu season. And this particular flu vaccine that we're using this year, um, the CDC in the US is claiming is 30% effective. Australia said no, it was actually 10% effective. So should you get a flu vaccine? Well, it might reduce your risk by 10%. Um, and so if that's an important number for you, then sure, absolutely. But if you're expecting a huge benefit from this year's flu vaccine, you're not gonna get it. And the CDC has actually, you, you can get all of this information from the CDC website. Um, you just have to dig for it in their, in their stuff. They've got the graphs of the effectiveness of all the last vaccines. And what you'll see is that on average, the vaccine is about 38% effective. Um, which is interesting because at least in the United States, when we have a vaccine that's 38% effective, like the tuberculosis vaccine um, is 38% effective, BCG, we don't administer it because we say that's not enough. So um, I don't know why it's different with flu. I think everybody's still freaked out by the fact that people die from flu. People buy, die from tuberculosis as well. So anyway, I just, I just throw that out there because I tend to get on, a, <laughs> I get on my box every once in a while. All right, let's talk about endocannabinoids. Depending on whether you, when you went to med medical school, you learned about endocannabinoids or you did not. Um, but what I want to say about endocannabinoids is that they are an endogenous set of, neurotrans of neurochemicals, um, and we discovered them when we started studying marijuana. But they're endogenous, right? So you have two uh, endocannabinoid receptors, CBR1 and CBR2, and CBR1 is everywhere. If you look at a brain scan of CBR1, it is like all over the brain. It is everywhere. CBR2 is primarily on immune cells. So do endocannabinoids have effects on immunity? Absolutely they do. They actually um, can increase the response in B cells, T cells, macrophages, um, dendritic cells, neutrophils, and NK cells. Pretty much I left off eosinophils, basophils, and mast cells. Those are the only cells that we don't think are um, responding to endocannabinoids. We also see that endocannabinoids with the receptor 2 are um, involved in psychiatric disorders. So when people say they have um, marijuana-induced psychosis, it's real. Like there is a psychosis that can be induced by um, endocannabinoids. So what do they do? Well, when pathogens stimulate macrophages and dendritic cells, there's a reduction of the expression of endocannabinoid degrading enzymes. So then you increase the endocannabinoids. And that increases B cell migration, migration and shifts cytokine profiles. How does it shift cytokine profiles? Well, it turns out if this is our, our immune response, where we start with a pro-inflammatory response, and then we go from pro-inflammatory to Th1 or Th2 or Th17, endocannabinoids can either drive Th1 or Th2, or they can also increase the T-regulatory response, right, which can shut down Th1 or Th2. 
And endocannabinoids can decrease the pro-inflammatory cytokines, which is why they work so well for pain. Because when they're decreasing pro-inflammatory cytokines, they're decreasing IL-1, IL-6, and TNF-alpha. Now, endocannabinoids can do that. And I want to point out that endocannabinoids and, can and cannabis are different. They're different neurochemicals. Look how different this guy looks from these guys, right? The endocannabinoids and the cannabis are different. Whereas endocannabinoids modulate TH1 and TH2, plant-derived cannabis, cannabinoids, increase TH2, okay? So they're different. What they do is different. They bind to those receptors differently. So if you stimulate endocannabinoids without cannabis, how do you do that? How do you do that? How do you stimulate endocannabinoids? Well, you can do it with a polar plunge. This has actually been studied in humans. The polar plunge increases endocannabinoids. Magnolia will do it. Caffeine increases endocannabinoids. Olive oil, kava, and flavonoids, specifically from berries. 